genre for us? Because no festival uh, really can exist or have any spirit at all without its audience, because you make the festival. Anybody can put up a little wooden stage in a forest and uh, if the animals don't come, then it, 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 it's not rocking. But this is rocking, this is a really, really rocking forum. And uh, something that I don't know is, is, is said enough to the audience is how much we who do get to, to stand on this stage, how much we get out of being here, how much we get out of being with you, talking with you, and, um, and talking with each other, because we, we're here on a sort of, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's like a, a, a vacation, a sort of school, school vacation for all of us. And we're looked after, we don't have to feed ourselves, and we wander around um, on, a, on a sort of uh, out-of-school break, and uh, we learn from each other. And what I really, really loved uh, when I woke up this morning, thinking about what on earth we were going to uh, offer you on the stage today, uh, is noticing how much I got out of the last three days here, just too much really to, uh, to, to describe to you. But it's a very interactive thing, and meeting you is the heart of it. And, and on that note, today we will do the session quite differently from our usual format, whereby we have a discussion um, or a debate, and towards the end of the panel we open it up to the floor. We'll actually open it up pretty soon, and we'd like to have questions from you. And the questions would be around education. Because, um, am I correct in assuming that every one of you have been to a school, or you have some interest in a school, you may have children going to a school, you may be thinking about a school, um, education is, is part and parcel of this festival. And today's talk, and uh, this discussion with Tilda, is actually about education, something she feels very strongly about, very passionate about. Um, and uh, we would like to hear your thoughts, comments, questions about education, because um, it's only then we will sort of frame our thoughts and we have our opinions too and we will we'll like to share and make it a more interactive session as opposed to us trying to preach to you our beliefs. So, um, if you're in agreement, we'll actually open it up now. Um, yes, I would like to remind everybody that even those who have never been to school or will never go to school are educated. They are absolutely alive and absolutely responsive <laughs> and absolutely dignified. And so even if you have not been to school or are not intending to go to school, I would like to ask you, anybody who would like to offer uh, an answer or a reflection or a suggestion to the question, what is education to you? What might we think about when we think of education? I think there are some microphones that might come your way. Do in the back, in the middle? Uh, thank you, and it's again a pleasure to listen to you. I'm Farah Kabir, I'm a Bangladeshi. Um, I grew up with my parents split because my mother was an educator and she believed very strongly in sending me to school. My father, on the other hand, said, if it's in her, she will get educated. On hindsight now, I think, I used to tell my father that I would take you to the UN because because of you moving around, I never went to school. And when I got married, I said to my partner that my sons or my children will go to the same school and graduate. So I find that for me, education is all about learning. And I have managed to learn. It's a life cycle. But what my children got, because they went to the school for 10 years, was, was learning with friends, learning and attending different sessions. I never studied physics. I never got the opportunity to study biology. I have studied as an adult, but that journey is important. But I don't think education can be restricted just to, those, uh, to the academia. It has to be learning from every opportunity. That's what education is for me. We'll take more questions um, or comments. That's one in the third group. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Shampar. I'm from Dhaka. I live here. For me, education means empathy. 
and I don't think education has anything at all to do with what kind of degree you have, what school you went to, or what medium of instruction you had while growing up. To me, when I see an educated person, I think to myself that that woman or that man is educated because of the way they behave and the way they act towards other people, and that comes from empathy. So for me, education equals empathy. <laughs> Back on uh, the left hand side. <coughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Palzim. I'm from right here in Dhaka. And I have a question actually. It's going to sound a little vague or general, but please bear with me. My question is Do you think it's actually possible to create a structure to teach creativity <coughs> to children, for example? And if such a structure exists, what would your opinion be on how it should look like or how it should be, you know, structured? That's a great question. And I think we there's will another answer hand raised it. on the We left. will answer it, but, and we will remember and remind us if we forget. But let's ask these questions first. But thank you for that question. Good afternoon, Lady Tilly. Well, sorry, just calling you on the pit then. But I do want to say, the education is wisdom and from your quotation from the Dr. Strange, I would say nothing's forbidden, just few practices. Hello, um, I'm Nuha, um, I'm a fresh graduate and I'm an architect and what I've <coughs> learned or tried to explore that for me, education is enlightenment because I think starting from my seventh grade history book, I used to pretend that all the correct characters there were creating dramas in my head and creating more opportunities to imagine and opening more doors at what life was and what, what it could be. And, and from there, opening more doors to arts and philosophy and, um, well, for me, it's, education should be uh, the freedom that gives you the power to think and to explore and to be brave and to be independent. I think that's education for me. Thank you. Hi. Um, for me, um, education is being humble. The more educated we are, the more humble we are. Beautiful. And there's a gentleman just down there behind you. There she is. I think education is not... Education is to learn the truth. If you can learn these things without uh, from book or other things for your life cycle and other things. It is not to only for learning from book or other or, or institution. Institution cannot teach you the right education, but if you can learn from your life, it's the education, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Kamrul Hassan. I'm a teacher. To me, education is adaptation. Learning how to adapt to environment, the changes. Because survival is the most important portion. Thank you. I want to suggest, I would like to hear from everybody, but I want to suggest that we talk a little bit and then we can continue this questioning a little later. I'm struck by something, I don't know if anybody else has noticed, but pretty much everything that everybody has mentioned can be learned out of school. And pretty much everything that people Oops, that people have mentioned um, can be uh, inhabited by somebody before the age of seven. Seven year olds, five year olds, three year olds are very adaptable. They are very dignified, they are very humble, etc. etc. The question is how do we as a society, and I think I'm sure a lot of you, whether you have children of your own or not, you were all certainly pre seven and you may have a close relationship with somebody now, pre-7, these are properly individuated and dignified and gathered individuals 
who are highly intelligent. How is it that we as a society keep them that way? How is it that we keep ourselves that way and at the same time give them the opportunity to adapt into their adulthood to become adults who can properly interact with each other and form the future? So this is the question that I want us all to talk about here today. Um, and, we'll, and I want to, to go to the wonderful question that the gentleman at the, at the back asked about creativity. You reminded me of something that I once heard, which is apposite, about a, a teacher in somewhere in Europe whose children uh, in her class, a primary school teacher, whose children were customarily winning art prizes in national and international art contests. And, uh, I mean, really quite regularly they were they were they were winning these prizes and she was asked uh, what do you teach them and she said well I don't really teach them anything I just know when to take the work away from them at the right moment I think the teachers will understand why this is a, a resonant thought um, I want to talk a little bit about a school that uh, I am privileged to be a part of running in the, in the northeast of Scotland. And the reason I want to talk about it is not because it's in the northeast of Scotland, although that happens to be where I live, um, but because I'm impassioned about the model of education that we're working on there. And I'm particularly mindful that I believe, and you may or may not agree with me, that there are models that we're beginning to work there that are really transportable around the planet. They are not entire, not to do with tech, they're not to do with anything that can't be scaled up incredibly uh, easily and incredibly cheaply, frankly. Uh, economically is actually the, the word, isn't it? Not cheaply, sorry. Um, but the, 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 the thing I want to talk to you about is this empowerment of childhood with and without school. And for us to talk about whether it's possible to imagine a society that's built out of this kind of education. And the reason I wanted to talk about it today is that, as I said, the last three days' panels have fired me up so much because I don't know how many of you have been here for the last three days, but if you haven't, let me tell you, on this stage and all the others, um, these extraordinarily enlightened beings have been constantly talking about the obstacles we're banging our noses up against. And these obstacles are usually founded on a kind of binary principle. This morning it was about what's cool and what's uncool. People talk about the left, they talk about the right, they talk about gender, male and female only, by the way. Um, you know, go figure. They, I'm not criticising this discourse, because this is the discourse that the world seems to run on. But I have a suggestion that we actually tease this binary system apart. The best people to tease this apart are people under the age of seven, by the way, because they live pre this binary world. So I want to tell you a little bit about the school that I run in the northeast of Scotland. And, and Asan is, um, has become, since we met a couple of years ago, has become uh, a member of the board. So we thought, that we, since we have you captive, we'd tell you something about it. Uh, my own children, uh, went through this school. They are now 21. They're twins. They graduated from this school two years ago. This is a school that employs the use of no exams at all. And, and here's the kicker, because we all wonder when we're parents, we wonder about uh, you know, whether or not we're going to commit our children to being without higher education. And there is something about the gaining of certificates that might get us into the higher education that's valuable when we're parents. Let me tell you this much. My children's class, there were 16 uh, graduating children, there was one who did not apply to college or university. All the others, 15, have gained places in national and international colleges and universities with no exams. This of course says something, quite a lot, about the colleges and universities. I would suggest it says that they are really sick of getting these 18-year-olds 
totally neurotic, totally overstressed, having got four A's at A level and um, being addicted to all sorts of uh, antidepressants, um, who don't actually have any life skills or any sense of humility or any sense of adaptability. Uh, coming and, um, and taking up the places, and they are very, very keen on these, I would suggest, rather more self-sufficient and adaptable individuals that come through the kind of education that we're privileged to work with at, at Drum Duan, which is the name of the school. So this school is based on the tenets of uh, an educator from the early 20th century, a German called Rudolf Steiner. Sometimes you hear his uh, educational model described as Waldorf. The reason, by the way, it's called Waldorf for those who speak German is not because, as I used to think, Waldorf sounds like a village in the forest. It's not that. It's because the first people to give Rudolf Steiner the money to run his educational experiment was the Waldorf cigarette factory. So, you know, we take it where we can. Um, he understood that a child's development can be looked at in the following ways, that the first seven years of a child's life is about the development of the will. <coughs> the second seven years from seven to 14 is about the development of feeling. And the third, between 14 and 21, the development of the intellect. What this means practically is that the child doesn't enter formal education until it's seven. So before seven, you're learning how to climb trees, you're learning how to light fires, you're learning how to make friends, you're learning how to get bored, you're learning how to resolve disputes, you're learning how to grow food that you then eat from, with your own hands. And then when you're seven, you start to learn A, B, C. I remember when my twins were six and a half, my father, who was born in 1925, and you know probably knew how to read Latin when he was three, asked them to read, and they couldn't read, and he was completely horrified. <laughs> and I had, you know, I had to really bite my tongue, because it was a feat of real bravery to present him with these Caspar Hauser wild children, <laughs> six and a half, couldn't read. And they started to learn A, B, C, when they were just before seven. They were born in October, so the months before they were seven. And uh, by... March of the following year, they were sitting in the corner of rooms reading, completely reading. That's six months. I just want to ask you two questions for the benefit of the audience. One is, uh, if there are no exams, how do you evaluate their progress? And the second is, um, so the 15 who are now applying, or have they applied, I mean, just give they us a few places. examples of what they're doing now, so we know the system works. Yes, there, there are scientists, there are humanities, humanists, there are, so we have a boy in an art school in Glasgow, Glasgow School of Art, we have um, a boy doing criminal psychology, my own daughter is applying to do psychology, my son is doing engineering, um, uh, there are several creative writers, it has to be, conf uh, can con be confessed. Um, there, is, uh, there are three musicians doing classical music, um, biology, um, there's one medical student, believe it or not. Um, yeah, I, I'm forgetting people, but it's a range. Uh, I believe that what the, the, uh, the colleges are really valuing there is the interview. But in answer to your question, what they prepare in their last year is a portfolio, including a thesis, which is not unlike a kind of first year university thesis. They do a lot of self-directed learning. I want to just continue my trajectory through the education. I've given you part one, which is pre-seven. Seven to 14, the, the years of feeling. These are the years where the children learn entirely um, experientially. I always remember my children, um, when they were about 10, coming home and saying, oh, we're learning science. They felt very fancy because they were learning science. Only at 10. And um, they were doing light. They were learning about light. And I said to them, um, so, how was the light lesson? And they said, it was fantastic. We learned all about light. And I said, what, what happened? And they said, our teacher shut the shutters and we sat in the dark. 
their first botany uh, blocks, a block of three weeks of embryo. They, they do their uh, homework on computer and they email them to their teachers. I don't know what it's like in urban schools here. Um, but as we know, as any psychologist will tell you, the, the, a neurologist will tell you, handwriting is an incredibly important uh, method of dreams at all before uh, 16. They draw a lot. One of the ways in which you learn at Drum Duan <coughs> is you will get a lesson on Monday which will be told to you by your teacher. And by the way, our teachers don't use any textbooks at all. They are learning, they are teaching from their own learning. So you'll hear a lesson on, I don't know, the biology of the heart on Monday. You'll hear it. The next day you'll see it drawn on a blackboard. The third day you'll hear the same information but you will write it out and you will draw it. And the fourth day you will make a presentation about it. And believe me, these kids, they retain things in a way that I never retained things when I was doing all my exams at, at university. Um, I remember a very important moment when my children were about 15 and my daughter fell off a rock uh, uh, in, in Scotland and uh, in, by the sea and I came around the corner of the herd all this squawking and I came around the corner and her, her brother was there helping her and he's talking using all these Latin terms, oh that's your patella and this is that and the other and, uh, and I said oh so you've obviously done the knee and he said yes we did it last year. He had retained this stuff. I never retained my university work, I can tell you that much. Uh, they are learning how to learn, and it's a mystery to me not having had the benefit of this education, but it's really, really working. Um, I'm sure the audience would relate to this, as I say, my own experience. Um, sort of not study very much throughout the year and before the exam I'd cram. And I did very well by the way, uh, because mainly because of my mother, who's actually in the audience, just to please her and so I can be let back into the house. Excellent. Uh, it's cool. Excellent. And, and it was really about just making sure that I have my bedroom and have my little freedom of playing cricket and playing some music. Uh, so I do well in my studies, they can't interfere, uh, because I wanted to grow my hair at the time. And my mother said, if you get all A's, then you can grow your hair. It's so a deal. Those it's a deal. Things, yeah. Deal. Um, so, but this is completely yeah. radical, by the way. A lot of the audience would maybe even question uh, that, <coughs> isn't it, in the, in the age of, as we say, the internet age, you're introducing screen at, at 16? Uh, isn't that like almost like a, being disconnected from the world, uh, almost like being in uh, like the Amish community? or you know? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you one thing about my 21-year-olds. So I'm sorry to use them as, as labor laboratory rats, but, um, <laughs> but I... I, I if they were here, they would roll their eyes. They're kind of used to it. But they, they are not addicted to the thing. They know they can live without it. If there's a big electric storm, they're cool. They can deal. It's not a thing that they rely upon to think or to be amused or to be engaged. They have an attention span. And we've talked on these stages in the last few days about, you know, over techno overload. If we support, I won't say create, because we're not talking about creating people here, we're talking about supporting natural intelligence. Anybody who's seen a three-year-old with a bar of soap or a, or a rock, you know, talk about attention span, that's endless, it's there. You don't have to instill this in children. You just have to step away from the vehicle and let it grow and develop and give it confidence. And I think that technology is a mega distraction in this sense, too early. It can disrupt a child's natural rhythm and a natural curiosity. Um, and it's just a question of delaying it. I mean, you know, my children are as interested in Instagram as anybody. It's just that they know they can live without it. Um, and that's a great difference. And of course, but they're already very old, my 21 years. I mean, you know, people of seven, they are... They have an opportunity to be fully bionic in a way that my children, you know, they are at least part mortal still. Um, it's it's, a, it's an, a difficult choice, I know, for parents in cities particularly, because when your child is going to school, you want a child to be able to contact you when they're very young. Uh, I understand that, and we have the luxury of living in the country where my children were never really 
that far away from the ability to get in touch with someone. So, so I know that's a, a thing to be negotiated. But it's a thing to think about. It's not necessarily empowering your child to tech them up too early. Um, do we want to take more questions? Yes, why not? Yes. Where does uh, <coughs> laughter, sports, and music fit into this uh, scheme of education? It's the absolute lifeblood. I would say that the sense of wonder and natural joy is absolutely integral. Absolutely integral. These children don't spend that much time in classrooms, by the way. They're outside a lot. And they're making things a lot. And they're making things together a lot. In the, 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 one of the last years of school, they're learning their science through uh, making, for example, there's a, there's, a, there's a moment when they're about 16, when the entire class take a tree trunk, and together, over the course of the year, they make a Canadian canoe. And this is where they learn all their science. All their science lessons are within this one class. And they learn their weights, their measures, their resins, their buoyancy. And then at the end of the year, of course, they, they take the risk and they sail it across the sea um, together. So they are also learning um, you know, a group endeavor. But believe me, there is no shortage of laughter and joy. It's absolutely the way in which um, the children are learning. Because as I said to you, you have here children who have had a fully developed will, <laughs> truly willful children. I, one of the reasons I suppose that this was so important to me as a mother, because honestly when I had my twins, I could not have been more thrilled to be a parent, but there was one subject that used to make me sleepless at night, which was, oh my God, they're going to have to go to school. How am I going to find a school that I can bear for them to go to, particularly when I already saw how incredibly inventive and alive they were? Uh, I had been brought up for my sins by, um, by my, in a kind of Edwardian uh, world, uh, where my parents farmed my brothers and I out to <coughs> nanny. And my nanny had been to a nanny school where they were sort of taught to be nannies with a, a set of commandments. And commandment number one, I latterly discovered, was the child's will must be broken. <laughs> it didn't completely work, I have to say. But um, th this was my experience growing up. My schooling was built on, uh, not in a particularly toxic way, but in a very kind of you know, quite insouciant way on the idea that the child would have no real will, real developed will. The child would definitely bow down before the law of the school. And um, when I discovered this particular form of education, knowing that the first seven years of the child's life would be respected as the development of the will, that was a very important um, thing for me to discover. And so, you know, with will comes joy. Yes, a lot, a lot of music, a lot of sports. It's, music, interestingly, one of the things that I love about this school is that they do a lot of singing in the round. They do lots of part singing. When they're very young, they, they do it. And it occurred to me that if you learn very young, when you're seven, to do a complicated harmony, you are learning to hold your note. Whoever's coming in from the left and the right and up and down, you are learning to hold your voice and to harmonize, but to hold it true. And that's the thing that they do, they sing every single morning. And, um, and do you know an interesting thing? When I was at school, there were people who said, I can't sing. There's nobody who can't sing at this school. They just sing. Nobody's particularly tone deaf, or nobody's particularly better than anybody else. They just sing, because they've always done it. And they play music, and they dance, and, um, and they, and they play sport. They don't play competitive sport until they're 10. When they're 10, they start to learn about the Greeks and they learn about the Olympics and there's a Olympic Games that they go to and they learn to, uh, you know, throw the discus. They actually wear togas, believe it or not. 
and they learn a bit Greek, and they learn Greek geography. But when they get their medals, their medals are made of clay, and you don't get a medal for jumping the highest. You get a medal for grace, or you get a medal for kindness, or you get a medal for helping somebody who fell over in the last race. Hi, uh, One comment, one question, very quickly. Right up here. Hello. So, um, comment is uh, the definition of education, that's, that's what we are talking about. I went to a school where the head of the institution on the very first day gave us a very unique definition that still sticks in my mind. That uh, education is learning about something that you did not know, that you did not know. So, that's the common part. And uh, question part, about the technology and introduction of screen. As a parent of 14 and 11 years old, and I see a lot of people even with two years old right now struggling with the screen uh, very much. And I was reading a contrarian article just recently, and that raised a very good question that made me think. So, neither do I know the question, nor do I know the answer. Thank just you, I'm, I'm placing it the way it is. That's what then, we do here. Yeah. So, in the 19-teens, when telephone was introduced, people were very much against telephone. That was going to destroy socialization, destroy any discourse, destroy face-to-face -face contact of people. 1950s, uh, uh, after telephone, when it was like television, 1950s. Same thing again, that we're going to be cast potatoes, which I think were true, but I mean, everything else that followed from that. So same thing now with screens as well. So are we being a bit of a, a, a anti-technology when we say that no screens, no one, I do realize you're saying it from 16 years old, but where is the right thing? And in 100 years time, this will be like water everywhere, or even 20 years time, then what happens? I love that question. I don't think so. I really don't think we're talking about being anti-technology. We're, we're mainly talking about being pro-human. Um, but um, we're talking about finding a balance, finding it possible for the child to be balanced, to be adaptable, to be flexible, to have bent knees in the world, to know their own weight in the world, before they start being opened up and sucked into and mind expanded by this extraordinary technology. That's all. Um, and, and finding a way to um, hold off the way in which that, uh, I don't want to call it a distraction because it's so much more than a distraction. It is the world to so many people, um, that screen. Um, to hold off that uh, the allure and the nourishment of that world um, until such time as the child knows how to nourish itself so that it's not dependent on that nourishment and that it is a being before it's a social being. I'm just going to add a little bit as, as a writer um, and we discuss this all the time um, so, for example, if you post something on social media, uh, the, the gratification is almost instant because you see the number of likes or hearts and other things that I don't know about, you get quickly. But if you write a novel, uh, first of all, someone has to reach out to find the novel in this plethora of things that can entertain you, and then read it in his or her private space, and then maybe have the... I mean, Writers don't expect it, but if they hear the, how great the book was, that is the gratification, if you get it at the end. So I think be, be patient for this little bit of joy you get, this endorphin release as you see your screen. Oh, I've got 64 likes, how many have you got? So the, this is problematic for me, I mean, but th that's, that's the reality right now. I think that's really right, Asan. I think the relationship to time is really key. And I just remembered another example of uh, what I consider to be a great piece of teaching that my children received um, and I know that it really had an impact on them as learners. Uh, they had another science lesson, same teacher, the one with the shutters in the darkness and um, they, one day my son said, Julie wants to borrow an old fish tank, so in he goes with the old fish tank and two days later I said, what were you doing with the fish tank? They said, oh, we did this incredible, amazing experiment in science. Now, I don't know what the experiment was, but it involved a, a piece of paper on the top of maybe our teacher in the front would know what it was. T the, the, the fish tank was filled with water, 
there was a piece of paper with two holes, two straws, smoke goes down one and only comes up the other or something. I don't know what it was, but anyway, they were trying to explain this amazing magical trick that their teacher had done in science, in physics. And um, we said, Sandra and I said, well, that's amazing. So why did the smoke only go down one tube and not the other? And they said, well, we don't know. That's the magic of science. <laughs> Nobody knows. That's it. So we happened to see the teacher uh, a, day, a couple of days later at a parent teacher meeting and we told her this story and we said, how oh, so amusing, obviously they didn't hear the answer. And she said, no, I haven't told them. I'm going to tell them next term. I'm going to give them a month or two to think about it, to try and figure it out, wonder why it is, try and detect and <coughs> feel their way into. Uh, and then the next term she told them, and I don't know what the answer is because I'm not one of her students, but they really engaged with this kind of challenge to their intelligence and to their sense of wonder. And that's all to do with the relationship with time and a kind of relaxedness about feeling your mind evolve. A question I have, I think many of the audience may also feel that way, would this model only work in the countryside? So if you're in this city like Dhaka, you've seen how the city is and how things work here. Um, how would you envisage this model working here? I really hope, I hope and I believe, but these are very early days, that what we're working on might be transportable pretty much everywhere. We just have to find the formula in a kind of reducible enough chunk and a robust enough form that it can be scaled down, up and sideways into all sorts of uh, of uh, environments. The, I mean, there are Steiner schools. We don't call ourselves a Steiner school because, honestly, we are now developing into all sorts of new areas that we're pioneering ourselves. But there are Steiner schools that exist in cities, for sure, and Steiner education is very, um, you know, involved with and dependent on an examination of and a, and a, and a kind of rhythm with nature. Uh, and I, I don't know how they manage it, but they do. Um, but, you know, I, I'm really hopeful um, and committed to finding a way to, 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 to travel with this. I can tell you, in Bangladesh, uh, as a Bangladeshi, I know this very well, um, it, it all boils down to the certificate. Whether you want to get married, whether you want to get a job, it's all about the certificate. It's very important. How many certificates, how many languages you need, it doesn't matter how amazing a person you are, full of empathy, kindness, it doesn't really matter. It's the certificate. I understand that. And to a certain extent that's true all over the world, um, then let's say this, and, and with full respect to that attachment, because I'm not saying that that is not a really significant attachment, and for very good reason, because it's a, that the certificate brings with it a sense of democracy, and that's a very important thing. But let's say that then, that one certificate is not for an exam, but for a portfolio of self-directed learning and self-directed inquiry. But you still might get a certificate for that. Um, I'm sure that there are ways of adapting <coughs> with respect and with proper, flexible understanding um, you know, the, the cultural importance of these things. I think we had a question there in this third I mean, many questions now. I know, um, and you've, um, in the discussion that has just taken place, you've kind of moved into the area that my question was about, because I've been sitting, listening in um, awe and um, some envy about um, the fact that your teachers in your school have, so, they're so lucky to be able to work in this way. Because I think, I'm, I'm a teacher, and um, I think there are many teachers who would listen and share everything that you've said about education. And I think that um, it's less about being radical because I think these ideas have been, as you acknowledged, around for a long time. Um, it's not about being radical, it's about having the bravery to swim against a tide. Because I come from, I've taught in Scotland and England and Sri Lanka. And so I have some experience of education system, the not the What's accepted as the norm in education um, in three places? Um, and what you're describing, I think, is at the root, it would be in every teacher's heart. But the opportunity to actually put it in practice is rare. And um, in order to swim against such a strong tide, 
that exists in these societies. You do have to be very brave. And if you're working in government schools in Sri Lanka, for example, and I think that it's not too dissimilar in many parts of India and Bangladesh, gosh, that's a big tide to swim against. If you're swim trying to swim against the tide in the UK, um, similarly, it's a, it's a big ask because everything else is going the other way. And they're saying, produce the assessment material, test these teachers after teachers will say, we don't need to test them. We can see what's happening. Listen to us. But um, teaching is not held in, mostly, in great esteem. Um, what's held as in, in high esteem by our society is not the arts, and you see that in the way that the national curriculum in the UK is just, the arts are just, they're out the window, sidelined. And if you listen to people like Ken Robinson talking about how schools destroy children's creativity, you will hear exactly what we're talking about today. So there's my blah, blah, blah statement and um, support. Now the question that I've been trying to think, how do I, how, what advice would you give to teachers working now in not the wonder of Druandan, uh, sorry, your school, but in ordinary government schools, what can they do to incorporate this thinking into their day-to-day -day work without losing their jobs? That's such a huge question. I just want to address it a little, little bit, although it stands for itself. It's a question to, for all of us. Uh, the first question is, I'm not the person to say that because I don't work in those schools. Um, uh, and you, you know much better than I do. Um, but I will say um, that, and by the way, of course, uh, swimming against the tide is absolutely what we're doing in Scotland. And we have a really very uh, enlightened uh, the, the government in Scotland, um, and uh, they are very interested in what we're doing, and in fact, they, they, they are, we're in talks with them constantly um, to, to see if we can infiltrate the state system more. We're, it's a long conversation that we're having with them. Uh, but still, we are floating against the tide, swimming against the tide, and we are, a private school, we are not subsidised, I mean we're subsidised by uh, interested patrons, but we're not subsidised by the state in any way. But what I, will, what I wanted to add is yes, absolutely, courage from the teachers, but really courage is needed from the parents. It takes so much courage for parents to believe in this and to take, I mean it takes enough courage to be a parent in the first place, but to, to to actually throw yourself off the parapet into this kind of system as a parent does take an enormous amount of courage. I can tell you as someone who now has 21 year olds who went through it, it is worth it, it is worth it, it is worth it. They will deliver, the children deliver this uh, curriculum and have your faith in them. Find teachers who are up for it, create a little school somewhere and go for it if you possibly can. gentleman has got his arm raised again. So great to hear from teachers. Uh, Dilda, your experiment is fascinating. And there have been many experiments like this all over the world. I don't remember the name, but there's an English movie, American movie, where the father is taking uh, his children, a lot of them, to the jungle for this kind of experiential yes. Yes. yes? Yes, yes, that's, yes. That's uh, yeah, Captain fair. Fantastic, yes. Yes, and yes. I also remember an American uh, educational psychologist telling that in America we don't need schools, we need more playgrounds. And uh, my question is actually whether your school has, Drum Duan Hill has become a model. And uh, if it, is, it cannot be replicated everywhere like urban cities, uh, is there a blend of experiential learning blended into the conventional system of education? That's my question. We, thank you for that question. We would like 
in our very embryonic way to become a model. We are working on ourselves as a model. And as I say, we've already started talking to the Scottish government. Uh, a very interesting thing I wanted to say when we were talking to the, to the um, Deputy uh, First Minister of Scotland, John Swinney, who's Minister of Education, about, um, about uh, we, what we wanted was for them to say that they would fund us as a pilot so that we could uh, uh, develop ourselves and then find a way of infiltrating ourselves into, this, into the state system. We're not quite there yet. But when I asked him, um, what is the one single issue that keeps you awake as First Minister, Deputy First Minister and as Minister of Education, he answered in a heartbeat. I thought he was going to say the attainment gap. But he said, mental health. Mental health is the issue that keeps me awake as Deputy First Minister of Scotland, and it all starts with education. In fact, it starts even before education. It starts with um, a, a relationship with the parents and a relationship with the adult world. And this is why this is so important. This is why I want to talk about this today. All the subjects that have been discussed here in the last three days all make me want to say, let's go back to these years. Let's go back to finding a way to embolden intelligent and enlightened children to remain that enlightened, to remain that open, to be up for learning to know that learning is available to them, to know that those things they don't know are available to them, and they have all the skills they need to learn them. Um, this, this is the model that we're, that we're trying to infiltrate. So many hands, I love it, I love it, I love it. I want this to go on and on and on. Oh, anybody, anybody, fight it out. <laughs> that lady there. Um, to me, education uh, should, the things you're saying, that uh, mental health pro uh, issues, that I've seen my friend struggling so much with education, the traditional system of our academy, and uh, they dro they're dropping out because they're so frustrated with this system. And uh, here education is not, uh, is not um, curing our mental problems, but these are uh, just putting, um, making it. Uh, the education is a reason of mental illnesses nowadays. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we are talking about the children, uh, the, how the seven-year-old children can learn in this process, very highly creative, the on drum to and hill. Uh, but w we have passed that age. We have passed that age, but it's still we are struggling to learn things. <coughs> and uh, my friend, she dropped out, and I keep telling her every day that how can she can still do great with her life in the future. So how can we apply this to our life, and so that we can teach our children in a better way? So it never ends. You have everything you need. Everything, even the fact that you're here today, you've got it all. You just relax, shoulders down, just. Be full of wonder, and it's all there for you. It doesn't matter. I speak as someone who had a high, high level Cambridge University, terrible university education, terrible education, incredibly expensive, masses of exams, totally overwhelmed. I didn't know a thing. And having children, which of course, if one is blessed with children, is a great way to start your education, um, that, you, you know, it's never too late to just, you just need to know that it's not some secret room, it's not the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's not some big giant projecting something against a screen. It's totally in you. It's your planet, entirely your planet. You just go out and own it. Thank you. Uh, that was do you want to talk about the everyday learning that people are doing already? So for example, we're drawing it clothes. Yes. Example you're talking about. Yes, that's something I was talking about last night um, with my friend about the possibility of um, of children in, in Bangladesh, for example, who are working and come out maybe for a couple of hours or three or four hours to, to, to go to school every day. This actually relates to what you were saying. Education, I think that there is a sort of existential problem with the idea that education is like a shelf that you have to somehow get up onto. Yeah. I would like to re 
frame that. Oh. Education is all in here. It's all in here. It's all in here. It's all in your hands. If you are a child of five and you are in a position in your life presently where you are working and you are lucky enough to be able to go to school for a couple of hours, one would like to think it was possible that you didn't have to work, that you were able to go to school for the whole day. But you know what? It's not the case for everybody. You are still edu being educated while you are working. You are still dignified while you are working. You don't go then into an, a schooling situation for a couple of hours where you are sitting on a chair looking at a blackboard, which is very dislocated from the work you do during the day. The more the worlds of education and work, and I don't just mean paid work, I'm, and I, I'm not talking about child labour, I'm talking about the work you do with your mother in the house, or the work you do outside in the field. That is, that's, that's education too. And the closer that one can bring all of this, the more emboldened you are, the more dignified you are, the more in your life you are. Talking of my ridiculous, highly uh, expensive education, I do remember sitting all through my school years, and to a certain extent my university years, waiting for my life to begin. Your life has begun when you are a week old, a day old, an hour old. Your life as a living, working, helping, moving, wondering three-year-old has started. You don't have to wait for anybody's permission to learn anything about the fly you're looking at. You just have to own it. So I think one of the things that I find very encouraging about this model of education is that it's, it's not about a spanking clean school and a fancy playground <coughs> and masses of equipment or a lot of technological you know-how. Know it's, it's a living space that a child's inquiry and wonder can move in and out of and then home and then into the woods and into the streets and into his friend's house and into her friend's bedroom and it's all one life. I think that's the thing that's really different. I remember thinking that my life as a child and my school were <coughs> separate things and I think that it's really psychologically, holistically important bring these lives uh, together so that the child knows that, uh, that it's alive. We have a couple of minutes left, so we'll take quick questions very rapidly. Um, so the yeah. mic has to be very roving. So, very quick question. Even standing up. Um, okay, yes. Um, okay. Um, a couple of things. You mentioned the model of education, which is sort of zero to seven. 7 to 14, 14 to 21. So my first question is that, is this something one needs to commit to from, you know, sort of, you know, the week your child is born, or are there ways you can laterally enter at certain states? You can talk about that a little. The second question is, I would imagine that this model of education you've been talking about would actually be uniquely well suited to children with special needs, children with non-traditional needs, and is that something, you know, out of the uh, example or experience of your school or other schools you're familiar with, you could talk about for the audience here, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes to both questions. It's an entirely, certainly what we're setting up at Drumdune is an entirely inclusive environment, um, and we have a lot of children which, uh, with what are traditionally described as special needs. I mean, there's a large um, uh, 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 um, intake of children who are diagnosed with dyslexia, for example, uh, partly because the learning, the teaching itself, uh, lends itself, uh, it acknowledges that we learn in different ways. As I described earlier, some of us learn by reading, some of us learn by looking, some of us learn by hearing, some of us learn by writing. All the children in this education do all of this, so nobody falls through the cracks. Um, my children had a child in, his in their class who had uh, Tourette's, and he was there for several years, and you know, he really flourished. Um, there's, there's, so it's absolutely inclusive in that way. And your question about when one can enter, first of all, the rigidity, I mean, I think maybe what I, what I described about the 777, this is classical 
Steiner educational theory, and we are based upon it, but it's, you know, it's, it's swingable, if you like. But certainly at Drumduan, we are taking children in, because we're a very new school, um, we've only been an inclusive school, I mean when I say inclusive, I mean we've only grown our upper school up to 19 um, in the last two years. Uh, we've, we have a lot of people coming in just for the last couple of years, which is really interesting for us and brings its challenges because of course if you've, if you've learned in this way from kindergarten upwards, there are certain rhythms and certain sort of, uh, you know, colours that you, you get faster. And if you come in from a from a state system or from a different kind of different education, it can be challenging. But a lot of people are a lot of young people are finding it incredibly. Uh, I would say therapeutic. I mean, it is a therapeutic education very often, um, particularly in that upper school. So yeah, open to all in every sense. Open to all. Time for one last there question. There are quite a few experimentations going on. I'm from Finland. Um, well, there's... the Finnish system, the state system is... Correct. However, let's not forget that for most of the world, the challenge still is getting kids in, into that classroom. Child marriage rates goes down in Africa when girls are in school. <coughs> Nutrition improves when kids are in school. For many parents, I would say most, it's not a question of courage, it still is a question of money. For many children, it's not just about creative learning, which we all want for our kids. It's also about getting that education that gets you access to opportunities. That has not changed, that still is the kind of basis that we're dealing with, and I think we have to remember that. My uh, mother was an elementary school teacher. I have a lot of respect for teachers. I think it's probably one of the toughest jobs in the world and it's one of the where you really hold the future of the minds and your responsibility of, of ensuring continued curiosity to learn is what's the responsibility on the shoulder of, of, of teachers. But I think we have to keep in mind that for most, the majority of children in the world, they need to get into that classroom. And for most of them, they need to get into that classroom to have a chance to get access to some level of opportunities. I would absolutely agree with you. And um, by the way, notice that we are not talking about homeschooling here. I did not homeschool my children. I, you know, ask myself the question constantly, what is a school? Why do we need a school? What should a school look like? How would a school sound? And that is a thing that we at Drumduan are committed to. We're committed to a school for, for that reason. That classroom, or rather that space, let's say, because very often our children are up, up trees, um, is, 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 a, is really a, uh, this is the, the, the crucible for their future society, so I would completely agree with you. But Finland, we study the Finnish model a lot at Drumduan. I think recently, the, the, didn't the Finnish education system start pioneering no subjects? Uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Well, I'm really sorry, I can see lots of raised hands, but we, we actually are running out of time now. Um, I, I would like to ask a question, I think, on behalf of the audience. Um, you said you didn't have a very good education. I mean, uh, you didn't enjoy the education, education process, the school you went to was one of the top schools and the University of Cambridge was great. I think there will be curious, curious minds wondering what you did right after the graduation that you did to get to where you are because you haven't done too badly. I, I met artists. I met artists. That's what did it for me. I kind of found my tribe. Thank you very much. Thank you.